Hello, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Reimagined in America. I'm Karobi Acharya, and I lead the Global Ideas for U.S. Solutions team here at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I'm excited for today's webinar on what we can learn from the world about taking the Sustainable Development Goals, also known as the SDGs, local. It's hard to believe, but we're already on our 10th episode of our Reimagined in America webinar series. Please check out the link in the chat to listen to past episodes where we cover topics ranging from food justice to connecting with youth. Thanks so much to those of you who are returning to the series and for those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. So before we start the conversation, just uh, some quick housekeeping. We're using the webinar format, so you are welcome to use the chat, but if you have a question for us or, or for one of the speakers, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and that's where we will be pulling the questions from. If you want to turn on live closed captioning, simply select the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen. And also the webinar is being recorded and you'll all receive a copy of the recording and links to resources uh, that we discussed today um, in an email later today. Um, our webinars usually end uh, after about one hour, but we've always found that we're in the middle of a fantastic conversation. And so we tried something in our last episode that we're going to do today as well. We're going to host an after party of sorts. Um, we know that many of you uh, might need to drop off after an hour, but for those of you who want to continue the conversation a little longer, we'll keep the line open for another 30 minutes and continue the Q&A with our speakers. All right, well, so today's story begins in 2015 when all the United Nations member states, 193 countries to be exact, joined together to create a plan of action to drive efforts to end poverty, protect the planet, reduce inequities, and improve well-being for all. This plan, which was called the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, built on decades of work done around the world to ensure that all people have what they need to thrive. At the center of the agenda are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, known as the SDGs for short, and the goals range from no poverty to decent work and economic growth to climate action. And each goal has targets that hone in on more specific issues. So here's a quick look at all 17 goals and what they mean for our future. We can be. We must be. The first generation to end extreme poverty. The generation most determined to fight injustice and inequalities. The generation that saves the planet from climate change. And this is how it will get done. The global goals. A 15-year plan for everyone, everywhere. With no one left behind. We, we will live in a world where nobody anywhere lives in extreme poverty. Where no one goes hungry. Where no one wakes in the morning asking if there will be food today. We will live in a world where no child has a diet of diseases we know how to cure. And where proper health care is a lifelong right for us all. We will live in a world where everyone goes to school. And education gives us the knowledge and skills for a fulfilling life. We will live in a world where all girls and all women have equal opportunities to thrive and be powerful and safe. We cannot succeed if half the world is back. We will live in a world where all people can get clean water and proper toilets at home, at school, and at work. We will live in a world where there is sustainable energy for everyone, heat, light, and power for the whole planet without destroying the planet. We will live in a world where economies prosper and new wealth leads to decent jobs for everyone. And we will live in a world where our industry our infrastructure and our best innovations are not just used to make money, but to all make all our lives, lives better. We will live in a world where prejudices and extremes of inequality are defeated inside our countries and between different countries. Where people live in cities and communities that are safe, and progressive, and support everyone who lives there. Where we replace what we consume, planet where we put back what we take out of the earth. 
We live in a world that is decisively rolling back the threat of climate change. Where we restore and protect the, the life, life in, in our, our oceans, oceans and seas. <laughs> we'll restore and protect life on land, the forests, animals, the earth itself. With peace between and inside countries. Where all governments are open. And answer to us for what they do at home and abroad. And the justice rules. With everyone equal before the law. We're all countries and we their people. Work together. In partnerships of all kinds. To make these goals a reality for everyone, everywhere. These are the United Nations global goals for sustainable development. Let's, Let's get, get to work. work. Let's make it happen. Great. So uh, I, I hope everyone uh, was able to name all the celebrities in that video. Uh, I haven't quite gotten there yet, but um, so these goals, governments, nonprofits, universities, and communities around the world have made the SDGs central to their work. They offer a framework to, to guide initiatives as well as a way to measure progress. Within each goal, there are multiple targets and indicators to help us track progress on the specific parts of each goal. And there's an end date. The agenda commits to reaching the SDGs by 2030. Embedded in the SDGs is the idea that no single entity can solve the problems that our society faces. They reinforce that we must work together in a meaningful way to ensure that no one is left behind. Although the United States hasn't made the SDGs a national priority or framework like many other countries have, American leadership is not absent. Cities, states, universities, philanthropies, companies, nonprofits across the country have embraced the SDGs in their work. From Los Angeles to Orlando to Pittsburgh, local leaders are harnessing the power of the SDGs. And just as they are learning from an international movement, these cities are also contributing to global change. This incredible ingenuity is what we'll focus on today. So before I introduce our speakers, I wanna take a minute to hear from all of you. So we have two questions that should pop up on your screen. So the first question is, are you aware of any efforts or conversations in your community or local government that are leveraging any of the sustainable development goals? Just answer yes or no. And then uh, you might need to scroll down to see the second question, which is why did you join today's webinar? And please just uh, select all that apply. So I'll give you a couple seconds for that. And Kyle, just let us know when, when we've got the results. Sure, we're at about 75% now. We're at 90%, so we'll leave it open for another 10 seconds or so. Okay, great. All right, so uh, very interesting. We, we've got, in terms of people's awareness of, of using the SDGs um, in your community, it's a split. About a, a, a third say yes, a little more, almost 40% say no, and then some aren't sure. And then why did you join today's webinar? 76% are uh, interested in the SDGs. Um, others uh, interested in solutions they can bring to their own community and 50% want to learn from other countries. Fantastic. So a wonderful group on the session today. All right, so I am ex really excited to introduce our two speakers. 
Um, Tony Pippa is a senior fellow for global economy and development at the Center for Sustainable Development at Brookings Institution. He studies place-based policies to advance social progress, such as using the SDGs at the local level. He also studies the future of US international aid and lessons from around the globe to improve rural development in the United States. Prior to joining Brookings, Tony served as the chief strategy officer for the US Agency for International Development. Tony brings a really unique perspective on the SDGs today. In 2015, he was a special envoy at the State Department and he led the US delegation at the United Nations to negotiate and adopt the goals. Majestic Lane serves as the Deputy Chief of Staff and Chief Equity Officer for Mayor William Peduto in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In his role, he leads the administration's focus on ensuring opportunity for all residents through education, workforce development, safe and healthy communities, and digital inclusion. He also manages the administration's engagement with national organizations on equity and inclusion efforts. Majestic has led Pittsburgh's efforts to adopt the SDGs, making it one of a handful of US cities to do so. He's worked with partner organizations across the city from universities to the healthcare sector to bring this framework to life. Welcome and thanks so much to both of you for, for being here today. Um, I'm gonna kick, uh, kick things off with a couple of questions of my own and then we will take uh, questions from the audience. And just as a reminder, if you have questions, please submit them uh, through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So let's, let's dive in. Um, Tony, let, let's start with you. How do the SDGs translate from the global to the national and then even to the more local level? Uh, tell us about what you're seeing um, in terms of cities adoption of the SDGs. Thanks, Corby, and it's wonderful to be here, and, and thanks for hosting this session. And it's great to be here uh, with Majestic as well, because I, I really look forward to hearing more about what uh, the progress that Pittsburgh's made on this agenda. Um, so just to, to dive in a bit, one thing I think to keep in mind is that the SDGs really reflect a modern conception of development. That is, you know, no matter the income of a country, that there's still work to do. And so they apply to every country itself. And that's the way in which when we were in the General Assembly, we were thinking about these. Um, so no matter how well we're doing economically in the United States, we still have issues of poverty. We still have issues of inequality. There are still things that we can do around biodiversity and climate change and, and good health and well-being. And so these apply to us um, as much as they apply to the rest of the world as well. The second thing is, you know, we negotiated these, that the SDGs are created from the perspective of national governments, right? The goals and the targets are at the national and the global level. But because they encompass sort of a comprehensive vision of development um, and how those things fit together, many different sectors and lots of local leaders have seen it reflected in the things that they're trying to do in their own local communities. And so you've seen mayors and you've seen local business leaders say, these apply to us. The SDGs have a goal, SDG 11, that's really about cities, but it's that from the, that's the viewpoint of a national government. And we're talking about cities saying, look, we wanna make progress on issues of inequality um, as well as issues of climate and, and, uh, and environmental sustainability. So, you know, when we think about this, there's been a, a sort of a growing global movement of cities and local leaders taking these on. And I, when I look at the globe, I look at places like Bristol in, in the United Kingdom, uh, eighth largest, you know, sort of urban area in the UK, and really always known for its environmental sustainability practices and goals. It was the European green capital in 2015. But also, and it's a very prosperous, it's one of the fastest growing uh, metros, um, pretty prosperous, but at the same time has really stark inequality. In fact, 16% of its population live in 10% of the most deprived areas in the country. And so you've got the really stark difference, um, even as it's a very progressive and prosperous place. And their mayor, Marvin Reese, said, this won't do. 
it doesn't do to take just action on climate change when we've got these kinds of inequities, especially as they intersect with race um, in the city. And so as they set out to create a city strategy, they said, look, what we really want to accomplish is reflected in the SDGs. And so they used the SDGs as a framework by which they brought lots of different parts of the community together, business leaders, the university, civil society leaders, people from the neighborhoods. They created even a governance structure with a set of boards that people could serve on to help create a city strategy that reflected the SDGs with some very specific metrics and benchmarks that they would try to create. And then created a series of sprints on a yearly basis to say, here's how we're all gonna join together to sort of make progress on this particular goal in this particular way and contribute toward that. Um, and, and you're seeing that with other cities. Uh, they also um, said to themselves, look, even as we do procurement and buy services for our city, how do we integrate the social value of what we're trying to achieve through our strategy and the SDGs into the cost benefit of analysis of how we're going to spend our money? Um, and you see that in other cities like Mannheim, Germany, Malmo, Sweden. Um, you've really seen cities start to pick this up and to start to say, how do we actually even do, uh, measure and report on our progress and even start to do local reports and reviews, something that we call a voluntary local review as to what the progress looks like in their city. Now, this isn't just global, and we're going to hear um, uh, some of what's happening in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in the U.S., but it's also a growing movement in the U.S., and, and you mentioned Los Angeles and Orlando. Hawaii has a whole bevy of uh, local leaders that are doing this work. Um, we're seeing it pop up in San Diego, Phoenix, Minneapolis, um, different places in Florida. So, uh, so it's really exciting to see that international and global framework also start to provide a frame for how U.S. communities uh, can do better as well. That's great, thanks, Tony. So Majestic, let, let me turn to you. Pittsburgh was one of the first U.S. cities to adopt the SDGs. And could you tell us a little bit about what went into that decision? And then wh what is happening? What, is, what does it look like in practice? Are you seeing um, any impacts already? And then finally, as you think about transition to, um, to the new mayor, how do you think the city will keep the momentum going? Sure, thank you. Um, well, one, I think the, the origin of it really was a, a couple of things, um, a confluence of events. One was the city's participation as we you know, came out of our post-industrial economy and went into our technological economy, you started to see um, a lot of the attention that was given to the city and the city became a, an attraction really for global um, talent and kind of global discussion. Um, but at the same time, we know that we had a lot of things that were going on in our city that fundamentally were challenges for us. And along with some of our other work around equity and inclusion that have been happening, we knew we needed a, a framework that gave us more of a broader view um, and a broader view of how we were to see ourselves. People may remember when, um, you know, uh, President Trump spoke about, you know, he here is a represent Pittsburgh, not Paris. And the mayor said, well, you know, Pittsburgh is aligned with Paris. Pittsburgh is part of a global community. And that's just an example of how we had to see ourselves, even with things that are happening locally, as connected to the, the global environment. Um, and, and what you will find in the SDGs for me is that many of the same things that countries are grappling with, cities are now grappling with. Like local, you know, mid-size, large, and even mid-size cities like Pittsburgh are grappling with many of these same um, issues around poverty, around gender equity, around education, around decent work, um, around people being well. I mean, these are not issues that are just the domain of federal governments and, and national governments now, but actually the domain of cities that have many of those same issues within it. So by being able to ident you know, identify with this framework, we were then able to really start putting our work in silos, but also silos that are cross-cutting so that we know that certain actions have multiple benefits in multiple parts of the goals, which allow us to then track and see what are we doing? Uh, what are the activities that are going towards our water, 
we've had some issues with our water and sewer authority. So the idea of our water is just as relevant as the na a national conversation. And so for us, it's organized our thoughts, allowed us to really look at our departments and authorities and say, who's working on what and how do we put those things in the appropriate places to be able to then measure them and then manage them. You know, um, it's often said what you can't manage, what you can't measure, can't manage. So, you know, the SDGs give us the ability to measure what's happening, see what's cross-cutting, see what are the most effective activities a government can do to actually impact multiple goals, and then move forward to see what impacts we're having going forward. Um, one of the things that have been important about it is to Tony's point, the conversation around using the SDGs as a unifying uh, North Star, if you will, um, between a city, corporation, corporations, universities and nonprofits. So for example, in Pittsburgh, as the city adopted the SDGs, we also have Carnegie Mellon um, who has adopted the uh, SDGs, the university in Pittsburgh. We also have Covestro, um, international company um, that's located in Pittsburgh that has also adopted them. So, you know, we have, there you have a confluence between corporate uh, universities and a city. And additionally, there's a nonprofit called the Forbes Fund that also adopted them. So now you have a conversation around a shared set of ideas that become difficult in this time um, with so many things happening in cities and across the country. It can be difficult to agree on a North Star or difficult to agree the efforts that you're, that you're doing in particular places. So the SDGs have been great for us to allow us to do that and connect with other like-minded institutions to set that North star. And the third question um, around what will happen is a transition. What we think is that the work of the SDGs has been that powerful and that there are other really strong institutions that have also been working on them and that, you know, the the SDGs are aligned with much of our equity work there in the, and um, this year we'll be going through our second VLR, aligning it with the budget and procurement. So we think that going into the next um, administration, that many of these things will just be part of the way that work is done. And that's also part of our goal. How do we make sure that the SDGs are just something to be thought about? And then also that external uh, stakeholders then say, you know, administration, mayor, how are you connecting with the SDGs? Because we knew how the prior administration was. So really kind of setting a framework and setting kind of a base for, for folks really to see where we can go from here. That's fantastic, that's fantastic. Um, so for both of you and, and, and um, what advice do you have for local US communities and policymakers who are interested in incorporating the SDGs. Um, and, and maybe Tony, if we, we'll go to you first and, and then Majestic, but what, what's your advice for, for local communities? Yeah, so especially at the local level, what we found is that it, the SDGs can seem really a, a bit intimidating and, and at some level almost overwhelming. You know, like, like Majestic said, and, and we heard in 17 goals, but even underneath those goals, as you said, Karobi, there's a set of targets and a set of metrics. So it's really 169 targets, and then even more a set of metrics trying to measure progress against those targets. And that just seems, you know, especially for a, 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 a government of a mid-sized city or even for a local business or something like that. Wow, that, that seems like a lot. But what we found, uh, especially at the local level is um, typically, there's uh, somewhat of a shared sense of priorities on the three or four or five things that that community really wants to make progress on or work on most. And we really think of it not as 17 and 169, but sort of the rule of three. So the SDGs force you to think through three different dimensions at once. The social slash human dimensions, the economic dimensions, and the environmental dimensions. And what you do is look at those sorts of priorities through all three of those dimensions and making sure that you're trying to sort of multi-solve or make progress on those three different dimensions at once. Um, and so thinking in those terms seems to whittle it down and also make it more right-sized uh, for the local level, um, I guess I would say. Great. M Majestic, what would you add uh, advice to uh, communities, local communities who are interested in incorporating the SDGs? 
Yeah, I would say really it's just looking at, you know, using it as a North Star and as a measure to say, hey, these 17 things, what's important to us and how many of these things fall within our jurisdiction, right? Like, you know, maybe you may have some situations where some things don't fall in your jurisdiction. Um, so maybe you might want to share and evangelize with the others that it does fall in their jurisdiction to share that. But focus on what you do. And also what we've done is really married it with our equity focus and our equity lens to say, as you look at the 17 issues, who is being unduly influ unduly impacted by this particular goal. So if we're saying decent work, who's at work and who's not at work. If we're looking at gender, uh, around gender equality in women, who you know what women are doing well in the city and what women, women aren't, right? So I think it really gives you different places to look and then ask yourself the next question of, here's the issue, here's our metrics, but then how do we disaggregate our metrics to be able to really get to what's happening in our city and see the nuance of, you know, who's doing well or maybe not as well, where's the opportunity for growth? So I really think marrying it with that, you know, an equity lens and also obviously our resilience lens. So with, with those two lenses looking at it, I think we've been able to really make it doable and, 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 and uh, kind of bite size it, if you will, to have that dialogue, but then also have a team thinking about all, all of it, putting it together. That's great. That's great. Well, the, the questions from the audience are pouring in. So why don't we turn to them? And just as a reminder, um, uh, you can ask questions and the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen. So uh, let's turn to, the, to some of those. Um, so one of the questions is, how do we learn what is already happening in the United States? Is there a central information center? Is there anything happening at the state level? Um, would we need to learn about efforts state by state? It seems like cities are taking the leads. Is there a coalition or entity to share efforts or outcomes? I think, Tony, that question is made for you. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of questions in that one question too. Um, so uh, a couple of things I guess I would say to the point about states or cities. I, I do think um, in the US, we've seen more traction and more leadership within cities or even surrounding areas of cities, sort of more regions. Um, Orlando, for example, Orlando City has committed to them. You have the, the Community Foundation, Central Florida Foundation also using that as a basis and they're working together with the university. And then even the outlying county and region are starting to work together. Hawaii as a state has done the first statewide review of progress. Um, and it actually sort of organized four different county uh, mayors as part of that, but they are doing it. I do, and they're, um, the Sustainable De Development Solutions Network uh, has done an index in the past that looked at sort of state by state uh, what, the, what the progress has been on the SDGs. But in terms of leadership at a state level, I would point to Hawaii. I know that there's some analyses happening in other states that are predominantly located within universities. For a central clearinghouse on what's going on in the US. So we've got local leadership on the SDGs program, uh, program at Brookings, but that's global. It's not just the US, it's global, but there's still a lot of resources on there. And we have partnered with the United Nations Foundation in the past on um, an event called American Leadership uh, on, the S on the SDGs. Um, and you can find you know, those two programs. Actually, out of that, we are about to launch um, a partnership with the UN Foundation. And one of the key pil pin pillars of that, particular, uh, of that particular partnership will be a web resource that tries to show what's happening in different sectors and in different geographies across the United States. So keep your eyes open for that. It's actually going to launch quite soon over the next couple of weeks. Um, and there, continue, there will be continuing content put on it in terms of small stories and case studies and things about, about who's doing what across the US. Um, but you do have activity in, in different sectors um, from philanthropy to civil society, to the business sector, to city and, and state governments. That's great, thanks, thanks, Tony. Um, here's a, a question about um, 
So you mentioned that the SDGs are created, and I think maybe Majestic, if you want to start with this question, um, you mentioned that the SDGs are created from the perspective of national governments. When we talk about localizing the SDGs, how do we also take into account furthering a grassroots approach to the SDGs? So um, I don't know, Majestic, if you want to start and then Tony can chime in. Sure. No, I think that's um, I think that's a, a challenge and the opportunity for cities across the board is how do you make sure you have this level of maximum participation and you don't have something coming from on high, um, even if it's good, still may not have the support of um, a broader community. So I think it's really about engagement. And in Pittsburgh, for example, we were able to do workshops and some things to, to let people know what the SDGs were. And we've also had the benefit of that there are some grassroots organizations who had already aligned themselves with the SDG work. For example, there was an organization that works with young people around sports and leadership, and they had already connected to the SDGs um, without even really knowing that we were doing it, frankly. They just saw it as important for the work to have a global vantage point. So we've had some grassroots organizations and some grassroots leaders that have connected to it, but I would say an opportunity in the future is to make sure that there's ample time and opportunity to really workshop what the SDGs are and make them part of the common language of, of community often and what they're asking for, just as right now you're hearing equity and inclusion and resilience be part of the common conversation. I think the SDGs as a framing could be a really good way for community to say, hey, what are we doing around decent work? What are we doing around water? What are we doing around equity? What are we doing around education? What, you know, what's happening? Um, and that's just, I think, a city taking the time and the resources to really kind of roll that out in a, in a, a grassroots level alongside with building it, it at the grass tops, as people would say, um, in institutions to make sure it's institutionalized. Yeah, and, and Tony, I know this is happening in many countries, really at a at a popular level. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was just going to say, like for example, a city like Mannheim in Germany, they actually use the SDGs as the basis for um, public survey when they were starting to develop what their city priorities were, as well as a series of focus groups and just sort of public convenings that people came to. But the SDGs offered them sort of uh, the organizing principle, um, and in fact. You know, we've done a partnership in the past with the Rockefeller Foundation for like this signature program called 17 Rooms, where we bring together um, sort of global leaders on their SDGs in each room and then, and then, um, and then uh, cross-pollinate. But that model, actually, we've seen other institutions and even localities use that as a way to just convene people from their communities um, and come together and say, here's what we think is both important and here's how we think we individually can make a contribution, um, which is really interesting. And I think the other thing that we should um, not forget about and actually really elevate when we talk about sort of grassroots leadership on this is youth leadership. I mean, this is really an agenda that has a lot of resonance with um, youth in schools or universities and you've seen lots of different uh, efforts, even across the US, Orlando has a great example of uh, an organization that's just using the SDGs as a way to bring youth leadership together, to work together and um, sort of plan together and, and uh, address a particular community issue by using the SDGs as the framework for that. Yeah. So let, let's talk about data for, for a minute. Um, you know, uh, as you mentioned, Tony, the SDGs were developed at a national level with national level kinds of indicators. And so the question and Majestic, particularly for you is when you think about the targets and metrics that you're setting um, within Pittsburgh, what are some of the biggest challenges that you've had related to data availability and quality at the city level? And how have you had to sort of adapt kind of the national level indicators and targets to a city level? Well, yeah, I think one of the challenges is um, the general availability of the levels that you need to hit with your targets. So if you're talking about, um, 
you know, kind of like water, right? And, and how water is dealt with and then, okay, was there someone that already had created some data on that or do you have a data relationship with a data collaborative? In Pittsburgh, we're fortunate that because of our universities, we have no shortage of people who are willing to create, uh, to uh, share data. And we're part of a Western Pennsylvania data collaborative where um, the city, the county, um, and all a lot of other institutions share data. So there's a place to be able to get information to extract it. Um, so we kind of have an embarrassment of riches on that level. Um, so for us, it's been a little easier to say, what, where is the data on these 17 issues? And then even again, kind of breaking it down is, you know, can we disaggregate it to look at the equity levels from a racial and gender perspective in regard to that? But I would say it, it would be challenging, but I, there's also kind of some, a lot of these national clearinghouses that I think can crosswalk um, the information that's out there to some of the challenges that are in your respective cities. And to think about whatever, whichever goal you're thinking about, like, okay, who kind of focuses on that? And then try to think about what, what metrics you need from them and then start that outreach to as your baseline. Thanks so much, Majestic. And, and Tony, what, what are your thoughts and what, what are you seeing in terms of the data piece of this and, and how, how cities are, are, are making sense of it uh, and adapting it to a local level? Yeah, so there's, there, there's a commonly set of accepted indicators for the national level. That's the formal architecture through the UN. There's no such set for localities, right? Um, and that's both a challenge and an opportunity, as Majestic was saying. And I think it goes to the importance of um, a community or a city knowing what they want to prioritize and then, and then developing the data ecosystem. And it might not just be what they're collecting, but they also might be working with organizations or neighborhood groups or universities to, to help with that. And we do see a lot of partnerships between cities um, and universities. But I, I, I think the one thing to emphasize is that the SDGs aren't necessarily built, especially for the local level, to be a compare and contrast on the same indicators. But I, think, I don't think that's where cities or localities are finding their value anyway. They really see it as a way to create a common language that, as Majestic said, means city government can connect with philanthropy, business, nonprofits, universities, but also community, you know, city to city or community to community then can exchange their own practices, innovations, challenges from a common place. They, they don't have to go through a, a lot of explanation with each other. They can say, we're honed in on this set of SDGs. This is where we're trying to get to over the next 10 years. The third thing I guess I would say is you are seeing, um, and Pittsburgh is, a, is, is, is an example of the, the data analysis they did in the VLR, but you're also seeing cities like Los Angeles and what's happening in the state of Hawaii actually create data dashboards online so that they can just be as transparent and, and real time as possible about what kind of, uh, what kind of progress they're making. It can be difficult to get the data you need and be disaggregated to the level you really want when you're looking at issues of equity um, and spatial inequality and things like that. But I think that's a really important step forward because it creates a different kind of dialogue between the citizens and their, their governments as well. Great, thanks. Um, so another question that's come in is sort of, and this is really, uh, you know, it would be great to hear from both of you. Um, how do you make the case for city or regional leadership to take on at the SDG framework? You know, what, what, what compels them to use the SDGs and then are grants or other funding typically involved to help kickstart the process? So I'll start from, from, from a city perspective. I think it's really, you know, talking about the compelling reality of having and sharing a North Star. Um, Often, you know, there are very amorphous things that are promised during campaigns and, you know, people run on very amorphous ideas of what's going to happen, making a city better, but often don't have the metrics or the measurements to really kind of define what that looks like and what that means. And I think to the SDGs give you a lens 
and give you a really portable structure in which to do it. And then also, you know, kind of an international perspective of what that looks like and means in other places. So it, it really gives structure to, to I think, um, kind of a hazy way that people may look at how you judge and how you judge governing cities. Um, so I think that's really the the really one that like how do you create a North Star that everyone can get around, that everyone can connect to, that you know cities can be held accountable to, communities can be held accountable to, everybody can really say this is what success, not just failure, but this is what success looks like. And I think far too often we don't really have that lens of this is what success looks like, but the SDGs gives you that. And um, the second question I'll say, I think it really, you know, uh, Pittsburgh, we've been fortunate to engage with um, philanthropy that supports many of these ideas and as well as national organizations that wanna make sure that, you know, we're at the table talking about these things as an example of our leadership. But I really think once you can talk about why you wanna do it, get the North Star, use it as an organizing principle for leadership, then I think the resources can, can flow from there. And, and Majestic, just I, I've also heard, um, and I think this has been true for Pittsburgh, is that part of the part of the pull is also the opportunity for a city to contribute globally uh, yes. to this larger global goal. Could you speak to that a little bit too? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, it was you know part of Mayor Peduto's vision was just to really take the things that are working in Pittsburgh and really present them to the world and talk about the levels of collaboration that are happening, that are going on, that then other people could look at, and really having cities share what we often call best practices. But I just look at it as cities sharing what's going on and then what you can take from it, right? And how you can maybe use it and pivot on it and do certain things. So it's really about how do we engage in a global community with our local challenges? And in the very same way, we know that there are things that we may not do as well that other cities may be doing well and we can learn from that, right? So it's really that communication, that language from city to city that Tony talked about that allows us now to talk about our shared priorities and shared interests um, as cities for the good of our citizens in ways that we can understand what we're talking about and can get inf information transfer. Yeah, thanks. Tony, how do you make the case for to cities uh, and local local regions? Well, well, just building on what Majestic had said, um, you know, I do think there's an inbred discipline, like actually having a, as, as Majestic was calling a North Star, but having an end date and an end point um, really sharpens the basis uh, for partnership as well. So I saw in the chat early on, somebody was uh, pointing to collective impact. And I used to call, when I, was, when I was at the UN, I used to call the SDGs sort of collective impact on steroids, because it's not just collective impact around one particular issue. It's actually, what do we want as a community for all, all levels of well-being? And how do we put out the targets the very precise, as precise as we can get the targets that we're trying to reach by a particular time. And if we can do that and get agreement on it, then it really mobilizes action. Like you can pre create partnerships that the kinds that Majestic's talking about amongst the city and the philanthropies and local nonprofits and the universities where everyone's comparative advantage is all pulling together. And it can also be across jurisdictional boundaries. So it could be the city government with the county government or a regional uh, thing thinking together. So I, I think that's, it's, it's both the, the North Star and then the basis that that provides you for partnership because of the common language and because of everybody being able to see what they can reflect in this, um, it can create a different way of, of even pulling together and governing. And I do think, you know, Kirby, to your point, the global facing aspect of it is just exciting. I mean, what we found in working with local communities is you don't start by bringing the SDGs and say, hey, you've all got to commit to the SDGs. You start by saying, what are your local priorities? And you know, as those get defined and you say, you know, actually making progress on those would contribute to these global issues in this particular way, that's just creates another level of excitement and another level of momentum. And frankly, for some, you know, uh, cities, um, larger cities, you know, it provides them a globally facing uh, 
framework in which to speak the language of what's happening, you know, just sort of uh, globally. And so if you're, if you're wanting like Pittsburgh to sort of be recognized globally, the SDGs provide you a way to be able to do that. That's great, that's great. So we have a question um, around narratives and narratives of progress. Um, and, you know, I think as you both know, the, for a long time, the narrative around progress has largely been around consumption and economic growth. The, the, the focus on SDGs turns that on its head a bit, saying that what matters most is social and human dignity, connection, environmental sustainability, and, and a host of other things. Um, with just economy, where economy is one of those dimensions. So how are you both seeing the narrative, um, i.e. the shared assumptions we hold about how the world works? How are you seeing the narrative change as city policy and operations align with the SDGs? Are we setting different societal narratives and expectations? Um, who would like to jump in on that one? Tony, if you can start with that one, then I'll, I'll come right after you. That's a big one. Well, I think we've at least seen the conversation change. I don't know that we've seen the behavior change yet, which is the the you know how do we how do we create the reality out of our rhetoric? Um, I do think you've seen a recognition of that, uh, and especially in a COVID environment or a post-COVID environment, we've seen that um, economic growth doesn't provide the resilience and security for our communities or even particular families or particular people in the way in which we think it might, right? And so, and the SDGs capture that. And, um, and it also doesn't allow us to decouple that economic progress from impacts to our climate or to our environment or what those trade-offs might be amongst different neighborhoods spatially, for example. Um, so I think, You've seen that recognition, and I think the SDGs provide you an entry point on how to try to struggle with that recognition. Frankly, I think one of the reasons why cities have become such leaders on the SDGs is because the trade-offs amongst those different things, like at a national government level, becomes kind of too abstract. It's like, it's like too easy for it to be divorced from real people. But in a city, like as a government and as a local business, like, you're, the people who are being affected are very near to you. And so you can, you can try to uh, understand what the impacts are on multiple dimensions more concretely and more tangi tangi tangibly uh, at the local level. Um, so I think, you know, but I think we need a whole new language. Like, is, economy, is, is economics just money or what? It, how is sustainable economics different than what we typically think of as economics? Um, and, uh, and how do we measure that? And, and what are the ways in which we think about that? And I think we're, I think the SDGs are definitely pushing us to get the answers to those questions more quickly. Um, I think it's still a bit of a process though and an evolution of, of how well we're doing on that. I don't know. And, and I, I'll be interested, the, uh, you know, Majestic will make this more tangible. <laughs> um, just to add on to what Tony's saying, I, I think it's the, begin, the, the beginning of that forming language, that norming language actually is not just forming, it's a norming language, if you will, the norms of what we should be talking about and what we should be looking at and what things, going back to what I said in the beginning, what things are happening that are cross-cutting. For example, what, where's the efficiency of our activities that are having the most impact on the environment, on the, our economics, and on our social equity, right? And if we're really looking and if we start to have that level of discipline that, that Tony talked about, we're saying, okay, you know what? There are certain activities that we do that have multiple impacts. I think that starts a language and a, a, a discipline that really kind of gets people in the space where they need to be and it may not produce the results right now, but it's the language of an organizing principles that from all accounts will produce the results, right? Like when people are on the same page and can operate off the same page, things happen faster and they usually happen better. And so in our cities, we need that to occur. 
Um, and that's a, that's a challenge that I think a lot of mid-sized and large um, global cities have. It's about really how do we get on the same page, especially when you have such stratification often by class and race and gender and country of origin. How do you start to resolve that? And I think the SDGs really help with that. Um, and the other thing that I would, I would really say about it is that it's part of a broader process. Even for us as a transition is going to occur, it's about us now saying, hey, here's a language that you have to be able to speak with Mannheim, Germany and Malmo, Sweden. Here's a language that you have to be able to really have this broader, um, this broader dialogue, which I think cities are going to have to have because we don't get the ability to, our disaggregation is pretty small. If you have a country, the, disag the disaggregation of Sweden or the disaggregation of Pakistan is pretty big as far as how, you know, what's going on. But the disaggregation of Pittsburgh isn't that big. We're 57 square miles, right? So you're only going to get so far and the accountability that you have is actually much quicker. There's a much quicker turnaround of accountability on SDG work and on metrics work than it would be in a national, um, a national context. So I think that's going to be really important as well. That's great. That's great. Well, so um, this is a, a fantastic discussion, and I think I think we need to transition and 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 we'll go into the after party. But um, I'm really uh, I'm really inspired by what I've been been hearing and learning from from both of you. So for for folks who can stay on a, a little bit, please uh, please stay on on the line, and um, we'll keep the conversation going while we have questions coming in. Um, but before we go to the after party, I just want to share a couple of resources. Um, our, our famous Blue Marble Quiz, uh, if, you, if you haven't taken it, please do. Uh, we developed the Blue Marble Quiz to serve as a simple yet powerful tool to help people discover the value of global learning. Take the quiz, share it with everyone you know, share it with your kids, it's super fun. For folks who have to leave now, um, and we totally understand what you do, um, when you go to sign out, there's a very short survey that will pop up on your screen. Your feedback really, truly helps us. And of course, we'll make the recording available to everyone so that you can see the entire conversation later and um, and share that with your networks. So um, thanks to, to everyone who could join us. And um, if you need to sign off, go ahead. And otherwise, let's let's continue the conversation and go back to some questions. Um, great. So um, let's see. One question that's come up is, um, what advice do you have with, uh, around how to collaborate and work with various local entities to achieve the SDG goals? And, and also for gaining public support and funding. So uh, what advice do you have for collaboration at the local level? So I'll, I'll start with, I'm sure Tony will be able to illuminate some kind of net international um, context, but for us, it's really about relationships um, and, and you know, kind of acknowledging that even if you haven't worked with an organization before, the fact that we kind of share some goals here, um, and then building a relationship really, really matters because you have to sit down and be thoughtful through some of this stuff. Um, you know, I want to say our Chief Resilience Officer Grant Irvin and his team have just been really, really, really important in the kind of in the weeds mechanics of sitting down with uh, Carnegie Mellon, sitting down with with Tony and Sarah, um, sitting down with um, the Forbes Fund as well as myself, and those mechanics of how, what we're doing and how we're aligning and our metrics and their metrics is really where the rubber meets the road and you start to get that level of collaboration. So I really think it's about the relationship and then the development of understanding how this stuff works together is really helpful for how you kind of make it go past just the performance of saying we're all using them, but then really connecting with, we're not just all using them, here's where it matters where we intersect. And I think those intersection is where the power and, and the greatness starts to occur. Yeah, I, I'd agree. I, I, I think um, setting a table by which those relationships can happen and really honest and frank conversations can happen is important. 
Um, and different localities have used different models. You've seen SDG alliances grow up in some cities and those are generally multi-stakeholder, right? They're not just, it's not just the nonprofit community, it's the nonprofit community, universities, businesses, and finding a way in which they also intersect with government. Um, you also see actually, so Bristol, you know, back to Bristol, interestingly, the university was able to secund somebody from the university into city council. Um, and then that person also acted as a liaison back to a larger SDG collaborative in the city. And so, you know, there are different models. There's just different ways. And, you know, in the US, we might steal from like the collective impact model and the, the tables that get set through collective impact, for example. Um, but as Majestic said, it can be, you know, I think the, the real starting element there is to build the conversation and the relationships. And then there are different models by which those can sustain themselves as you go forward. But, but, the, but I think the key element that from all of those is sort of building that level of communication and relationship amongst different sectors within the city um, that allows collaboration. Um, and, and, you know, I guess one of the things I would say is we shouldn't forget about communications, right? I mean, I think, I think one of the things that Pittsburgh's done really well is, you know, the city and the mayor have talked about the SDGs, the, the provost at Carnegie Mellon talks about the SDGs, like, and, and the CEO of Covestro. I mean, it's, it's something that they're also willing to, to use the language and the commonality of that language to say, this is a basis for ways in which we're working together as well. Yeah, I guess a related question is how have you handled skepticism and, and frankly, unfamiliarity with the SDGs? You know, not a lot of folks in the United States are, are all that familiar with, with them. Yeah, I mean, for us, we really made sure that we, from a more of a grassroots perspective, we made sure that we kind of connected it with things that people understood around equity. And then we said, hey, there's also this alignment with these global goals um, to keep people well and make people well, right? And so people can kind of understand that because we led with, you know, for some communities, people don't want to hear you're leading with the global context. They want to hear that you're leading with a local context and then going global there's other stakeholders that want to hear that you're thinking globally and making it local. So I think it's really just the creativity and the perceptiveness of, okay, who am I talking to and what should I share where? But that's one way that we've been able to really make it successful is to say, hey, we're leading around equity and these outcomes. And also we're attaching these 17 goals because these 17 goals outline and connect with all the things that the activist community may care about. Right, that then helps them understand why we're using these using this context and this lens. Yeah, that uh, that outside in approach is definitely the way in which we've seen the goals resonate and build momentum uh, locally. But it's you know it's honestly awareness in the U.S. is quite low of the SDGs, and you know it's it's not that they're completely recognized by everyone globally as well, but. Um, and I think, you know, we also see a little bit of the, these were negotiated under the umbrella of the UN and, you know, do we want an outside body coming in telling us what to do? So to Majestic's point, really focusing in on, this is what we care about. This is what we think is important for ourselves as a community. And by the way, it connects up to this global movement. Um, I think the other thing I would say though, Karobi, to this is that what, what we have seen, I think over the last year and a half is also given what's happened with COVID and, and kind of the inequities that that's exposed and given um, even the global recognition of what happened after the, the murder of George Floyd um, and sort of the global tone that that took on, not just in the US, I think we've seen a lot more interest actually in the SDGs or at least a desire or a, or a willingness to say, huh, how does, how does these all fit together and how do they fit with our context? Because I think initially in the US, you know, we were also butting up against the, well, these don't really mean, you know, we're fine, we're doing well. Like how much do these really resonate with us? If this, is, this might be for other places in the globe, but we're doing, we're, we're like a leader on all these different kinds of things. And I think 
those those kinds of uh, events have really given lie to that uh, particular kind of thinking. That's great. Um, I think we'll just take another one or two questions. Um, there's a question around, um, they say, I liked the discussion on the importance of community engagement. This seems key to developing intrinsically driven change that is grassroots. Do you have further ideas, recommendations, resources in terms of yes. grassroots engagement? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, again, like I said, it, it's, a, it's a place where we have done okay, we could have done better. And so I think for folks thinking about applying it to their regions, um, definitely whatever means they have, whether it's from a kind of municipal perspective and using outreach folks, or if you're partnering with a community organization that can hold, uh, hold workshops and kind of have kitchen, you know, kitchen table dinners to really talk to people around what's happening, whatever means you think is important to get people connected to the idea, I think is important so that the, the concept of the SDG lives longer than the administration. I think that's going to be a really important part of it becoming a, a bigger thing in America is if the, if it is the lingua franca of what's happening in community, then that's what people are going to be asking for versus this is the language of government talking about the best the best uh the best interests of community so you know while it still i think has to be done from there to scale it also has to have that that conversation i do think that going forward cities should really think about how do you engage with the nonprofits or use your your uh, outreach and your arms to be able to engage and do primers on language and primers on the SDGs and how it really meets the goals of community as well as a global context. I think also what's interesting is that I feel like the conceptually what is important to the SDGs, even the what I see in the chat, the interconnectedness of all these different things. So. Let's think about it. You know, if you were to put 100 people in the room and you ask them what, what's the most thing that they feel most passionate about the world making progress today, um, probably 99 out of the 100 responses, or maybe even all the 100 responses, would be somewhere in the SDGs. Like they would all be different, right? But they would all be reflected in this, in this pretty comprehensive interconnected framework. And it just points out the interconnectedness. Um, both of people's passions and, and also of the issues that we're trying to deal with. And so I feel like that's, trying to, that's starting to seep into the DNA. And we might not even call it SDGs all the time. Like if you look, and this, this doesn't answer the question directly because that was more at the grassroots level, but if you look at the Biden-Harris administration's uh, executive order on climate change, right? It's not just about climate change. Look at, the, look at the mission statement for the task force that is set up through that executive order. It's the SDGs. It's about good jobs. It's about environmental justice. It's about equity. Um, it's about innovation. It's about, it's about infrastructure. It's about an enormous amount of things that basically met. So even if they're not using the exact language of the SDGs, conceptually, this interconnectedness of the different things that we're trying to do together is starting to infiltrate. And, um, and I think that is getting to that earlier question around narrative shift. I do think that that's actually starting. And I, I think Majestic made a great, that, that, that word of norms, like the normalization of this. This is what we're actually trying to be about, I think is really important. Uh, that's great, yeah, yeah, completely agree. Um, so there's a question in the next 10 years, do you think we'll see a pivot from communicating the importance of the SDGs to achieving the SDG, SDG targets? So uh, you can agree or disagree with the premise of the question, but uh, Tony, you want to tackle that one first? Well, I got to say, so look, you know, a lot of, it, it might seem to a lot of viewers like what we've been talking today is sort of process, it's preliminary, like you got to, but you do have to get everything together. Like you have to get your house in order. You've got to get everybody speaking the same language. You want to get your ba baselines around all the different metrics and, and clarity on the aspirations. But then, yeah, then you got to do it. 
So I think we're we're moving from that phase of okay, now we're now we're getting there. And and even in the previous set of goals, like the Millennium Development Goals, I think we saw an enormous amount of effort over the last eight years of that 15 year period. So I suspect coming out of COVID, um, coming out of the new conversation we're having around racial injustice in, in the US and, and the focus on equity. Um, I, and, and even the way businesses are saying, you know, they're about sort of stakeholder capitalism rather than shareholder capitalism. I suspect we'll see a lot of effort being made Will we achieve the goals? I don't know. Um, I have my own thoughts about how close we'll come, but, uh, but I, I, I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll definitely see um, some targeted action that, uh, and some real intentionality around that uh, and, and increased momentum around that. Majestic, do you wanna chime in on that? Yeah, really quickly, I, I would say, I see it very similar to the conversation around equity as a, kind of a structural conversation. Five to seven years ago, equity, you didn't see many to any chief equity officers or resilience. Five to 10 years ago, you didn't see any chief resilience officers. And now they're all over the country, both, right? Chief equity officers and chief resilience officers are everywhere. And even now we have a federal government for the first time that's being explicit around equity and resilience, right? So that is five to 10 years of organizing um, to normalize that dialogue where now we have a federal government talking about it. I think that the SDGs have the ability to be in the same space because really, as Tony said, what you see in many cities and federal governments, states are, you know, states are challenged kind of, I think, because of a small P and big P political issue. But um, you see now that cities and the federal government are actually since doing this now it's just naming it and saying that's the target and how fast are we going to pivot towards the target right what what are our programs policies procedures that actually get us closer to the target and that's where i think it that's where we, it's the next step where we say okay if we say we're going to reduce poverty by 20 percent, what activities what set of activities do that what are the first four things you're doing that actually have been proven or emergent around reducing poverty or if we're going to reduce our, our use of, of fossil fuels by this percentage or we're going to divest from uh you know fossil fuels um in the in the in wall street right in the global markets what things do you have to do to actually get to that place so right now we're kind of normalizing it and then we really have to then say who can implement it and understand those policies programs and procedures to get us to that place that's great. That's great. So uh, one last question before before we close our after party. Um, this, this goes back to the issue of data. Um, and there's a question about what can we do to increase the amount of data being submitted to the UN? Looking at the SDG tracker, and there are many goals that have no data from the US, for example. Um, Tony, you want to start with that? Yeah, so, the, um, so a couple of different things. There was an online portal where the, you know, sdg.gov, which really hasn't been updated in, in quite a while. Um, there is more data on the UN site. The, the, the US's sort of portal has gone in, but there's, um, there, it's a good point. And the US, let's be honest, is the only G7, G20, OECD country not to have done a national review, uh, a voluntary national review of what progress looks like on the SDGs. I'm hopeful that that might change, you know, with this particular administration, especially given the, the focus that they're putting on, on issues that are really central uh, to the SDGs, such as, uh, like, like uh, Majestic was saying, around issues of equity, around issues of climate, um, those kinds of things. Um, but I, I do think that, uh, and I think that you'll also see an ecosystem of outside organizations, and you're seeing this already, start to do more and more analysis of where the U.S. lines up on the SDGs against other countries. It's part of uh, SDSN's global index every year, 
Um, and you've had, you know, the social progress index also map back to the SDGs. They, they are comparing the US where they are um, to other countries. And, and like I said, you had some, you've had some state by state and city by city analyses. Um, I, I think, I think, you know, this is a, a good conversation to continue to push our national government on. And I also think it's a place where uh, local leaders in their inter intersections with national leaders can also be helpful. And um, I think you are seeing uh, some of our local leaders really even globally being recognized for their leadership on some of these issues that I hope will then uh, provide some motivation for the national government uh, to be doing better reporting and be taking this more seriously and, and updating what they're doing. Um, and I think it's not just around the SDGs, but it's around the agendas overall. I mean, transparency of outcomes is just really important to know where we are as a country. And so I think as many voices clamoring for that uh, to the US is, is, can be very useful. That's great. That's great. Well, um, thanks so much to to Tony and Majestic for for the conversation today. Um, really, really interesting, and I'm really excited to see what happens next. I think there's just tremendous potential, and um, it'll be it'll be great to see what happens next. Um, and thanks so much to those who stayed on for this after party. Um, I hope you all have a great weekend. Please fill out the very short survey um, and don't forget of course to take the blue marble quiz stay safe be well and i'll see you on the next reimagined in america webinar bye-bye